second talk, uh, I was asked by CMC uh, basically to help people literally think about giving their lives to go overseas mm -hmm. and be used by God as missionaries among unreached, unengaged people groups. Uh, an unreached people group is a group of people who call us, us. They all know their same language, their same culture. But they basically, 98% of them have never heard of Jesus. They don't know anything about Jesus, 98% of them. Maybe they have 2%, uh, but the majority, 98, 99% have never heard about Jesus. An unengaged people group is a people group that calls us, us, and nobody has heard about Jesus, and no one's even targeting them. So again, there are 139 of those people groups in mainland China who have never heard of Jesus. And our job as the church is to reach those people. And although I'm not speaking on it tonight, Christ isn't going to come back until we reach all those people groups. We, the church, have a job to do. That's why Peter said we can speed the return of our Lord. We can make Christ come back sooner? Yes. How? By reaching all the nations by reaching all the unreached people groups. But it began to dawn on me that many people, and maybe specifically in the Chinese American church, are asking this question. Is it really worth it? Is it worth it? Uh, and uh, another way that I can, uh, there's many ways you can title a talk. Another way I can title this talk is, how's your E-R-O-I doing? How's your E-R-O-I doing? Now, what does E-R-O-I stand for? It stands for, you all know what ROI is, right? Mm -hmm. What is ROI? Return on investment. E-R-O-I is eternal return on investment. An eternal return on your investment. And we're going to start by looking at a favorite passage of mine, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. It says these words. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Now let's just stop right there. <clears throat> what tense are those verbs in? Past tense. That's why I believe in eternal security. It's a done deal. I don't know where the Chinese church is, but I believe in eternal security. Why? It's past tense. We are raised, we are seated with Christ in Christ Jesus in the heavens. But then it says, in order that. Oh. Paul is trying to tell us there's a purpose. There's a reason why we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. There's a reason why we are saved. What's the reason, Paul? In order that in the coming ages... He might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Now, in order to try to feel the full impact of this uh, passage, I want you to all hold your hands up in the air like this, like you're being held up, except don't hold your hands up, hold them together like this. On the one hand, I want you to count how many times God refers to us in the purpose clause. On the other hand, how many times God refers to himself on the purpose clause. Ready? Here we go. In order that, in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. How many times does God refer to us? Once. 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 How many times refer to Himself? Four. four times. God refers to Himself four times. He refers to us once and we say heaven's all about me. me. What I get. Streets paved with coal. Oh boy, I can't wait. Wait a second. We missed the 80% reference to God. What does God get to do? Well, he gets to show. The Greek verb is indictment. I've never studied Greek, never taken a Greek course in my life. All you need is a blue letter Bible, and you can find any word in the Greek. Very simple. Simple little app on your phone. Indictment. Indictment could mean to point out, to show, to demonstrate, prove. But the two that I'm going to focus on is to demonstrate and to display. 
God wants to demonstrate. He wants to live out. He wants to display His grace, His kindness, His grace. This is what God wants to do in heaven. So, here's the simple question. How can God demonstrate or live out or put on display His grace for all eternity? <coughs> what do you think would be some things that God could do to really put His grace on display forever and ever and ever? And you really have to think outside of the box on this one. But I'm going to actually wait for a few answers. What would you say? What could God do to really put His grace on display? This could be very boring if nobody talks. Okay. Some would say, saving us. Now put his grace on display. That's way inside the box. Forgiving us of our sins forever and ever, way inside the box. Giving us a relationship with him, way inside the box. Loving us forever, way inside the box. Sending his son to die for us, way inside the box. What's outside the box? Could he make us gods, yes or no? No. No, that's not possible. So what could he do just short of that? How about allowing us to rule and reign with his son over the universe? Would that be gracious, yes or no? Not only does he take a sinner and save us and die for us, redeem us, but he works inside of us to the point where he will elevate us to rule and to reign with his son. That is grace. That is lavishing on us grace upon grace. To not just be saved, but to rule and reign. I want to challenge you. That's your E-R-O-I. That's the eternal return on your investment here in this work. We're going to talk about that. The CMC leadership asked me to speak on why aren't more people getting involved with the unreached people groups or the unengaged people groups? Why are we all living our safe, secure, happy little Christian life? And I told them three reasons. Number one, Christ really isn't Lord. He's Lord only to a point. They're living like cats. Number two, they've never seen the Great Commission as a high priority in the Bible. I'm not going to talk about it, but God begins a uh, promise in Genesis 12, he fulfills it in Revelation 5, and everything between Genesis 12 and Revelation 5 is a story about God's heart to reach the nations. But number three, is I believe many Christians think it's not a big enough return on their investment. What do I mean by that? It's not a big enough return on their investment. Here's what a cat is thinking. Look, I prayed the prayer. I prayed the prayer. I go to church every Sunday. Radical obedience? I mean, you're talking about going to the nations? No way. Jesus is already building a mansion for me. I read it in John chapter 14, 2 and 3. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go and prepare a mansion, a place for you. So what? I've already got a mansion. All right? It's going to be big. All right? Big pool, lots of guest bedrooms. You know, this is huge. So this idea of radical obedience going to the nations might what? Make my master bedroom a little larger? Mm -hmm. Give me an extra guest bedroom? Or maybe make my kitchen bigger? Hello? <coughs> it's big enough. The cost is way too much than the return on the investment, so I'm not willing to pay the price. I'm not willing to pay the price. I'm not willing to break the norms of the Chinese culture. What would it be to break the norms of the Chinese culture to go overseas to an unreached people? What would you have to do? Well, you'd probably you'd be hurting your parents to some degree who want you to become what? Now, I see the smiles of the young people look down. <laughs> a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer, very successful in my career, getting my PhD. Yeah, you may have to give that up. That goes against all culture. I'm not willing to pay that price because it's not a big enough return on my investment. I'm here to challenge that thinking. I'm here to challenge that thinking. I want you to say literally to the next person next to you, 
This guy is telling me I may go to heaven, but I may not get a mansion. Literally, say that to the person next to you. That is what I'm trying to tell you. Some of you here in this room may get to heaven, but you may not get a... But we just read it in John chapter 14, verse 2. Ah, let's see what the text is telling us. Many Christians are confused with this teaching because some scripture seems to contradict itself regarding rewards. What we're talking about here are rewards. In Matthew 6, Jesus says, Store yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and seal. Store yourselves, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. That's a command. What's he saying? Store up rewards for yourself in heaven. Hmm. But in Luke 9, he says, we've got to deny ourselves, take up our cross daily, and follow him. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. So, okay, which one is it? Am I supposed to store up treasures for myself, which sounds very self-centered? Or am I supposed to die to myself? Or am I supposed to do all this to the glory of God? I'm just not sure. Well, how do we bring all these scriptures together? And first off, let me just tell you right now. Hearing this message once is not enough for you. You need to hear this message three or four times before it begins to sink in. Okay? So I doubt we're recording. Are we recording tonight? Ah, uh, we're recording. So get the message, listen to it three or four or five times. Okay? Let it sink into your heart. How do we, how do we combine? We're supposed to die to ourselves, but store up treasures for heaven and do it all for the glory of God. We find our answer in understanding how Satan tempted Jesus and Eve. You all know that Satan tempted Jesus. He went and fasted for 40 days, and then Satan appeared to him. He said, hey, turn the stone into bread. You've got to be hungry. And uh, jump off the temple and order the angels to rescue you. And by the way, worship me, and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. Now, Satan tempted Jesus in three basic areas. Okay, you ready? Number one was pleasure. Turn the stones into bread. Satisfy your physical body. Pleasure. Number two, power. Jump off the temple and order the angels to rescue you. If you order them, you've got power. And then possessions. Worship me and I'll give you all the kingdoms of the earth. So Satan basically tempted Jesus with power, possessions, and pleasure. <laughs> These are the same temptations given to Eve. Pleasure, the tree was good for food. Power, the tree would make one wise. And possession, the tree looked pleasant to the eyes. Now, whenever we see this, we think of the lust of the flesh. Ah, oh, yes, that's pleasure. The lust of the eyes. Oh, yes, that's possessions. And the boastful pride of life. Oh, yeah, that's power. But here's the key question. Did Satan tempt their sinful nature or their human nature. What do you think? How many say sinful? Put your hands high, God's watching. How many say human? How many are both? Yeah, <laughs> safe. The answer is human nature. Why? Eve hadn't sinned at this point, therefore she didn't have a sinful nature, and Jesus never had a sinful nature. So what does it tell you? It tells you something very important. The desire for power, possessions, and pleasure is a part of our human nature. We usually only associate it with our sinful nature, the lust of the world, the things of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the most part of all, that's all negative. Bad, 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 bad. But God put it in our human nature for his purposes. What are these purposes? Some of you have a drive. Some of you want to be the president. Some of you want to make it to the top. That's put there by God. Not you. By God. But he put that in you for a purpose. What was the purpose? To motivate you to do good works for his kingdom. And I'll explain that to you. To motivate us to do good works for his kingdom. God appeals to our human nature to want power, possessions, and pleasure. 
Now, you should be asking yourself a very simple question. <laughs> is this guy off his rocker? Is this biblical? Let's see. How? To the one who conquers, I will grant him to what? Sit with me on my throne. Men and women, what do you do from a throne? You rule and you reign. Always in the scripture, a throne revealed is governed, is defined by a ruler and people to govern and territory. Always those three things. To the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Christ says, I want you to sit with me on my throne and rule and reign with me. To the one who is victorious and does my will in the end, I'll give authority over what? Nations. If we endure, we will also what? Reign with him? That's power. That's grace. Possessions. Luke 16. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your what? Do you know the houses you own right now? It's not yours. It never was yours. It's not even the banks. It's God's. But God says, if you're faithful in that little bit, I will give you property of your own. Oh. I mean, for all eternity. Yeah, it'll never perish, spoil of faith. Wow. Property of my own. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance. The what? Prepared for who? What does God have prepared for you? What is involved in the kingdom? We already talked about it. A king, subjects, and property. A kingdom prepared for you since when? What does that tell you? That tells you that before God put the first electron together of this universe, he had a game plan in mind. And you know what his game plan was? I want to get people to rule and reign with me. I want a bride for my son. Here's our game plan. And he's beginning to act it out. If you're faithful in a little, I'll give you much. Also in possessions. Who then is the faithful and wise master whom the master puts in charge of his servants to give them their food allowance at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whom the master finds doing so when he returns. Truly I tell him he will put him in charge of some of his possessions, most of his possessions. Oh. What does God possess? Everything. The universe. And we'll be in charge and we'll take possession of what? You make known to me the path of life, in, and you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Power, possessions, and pleasures. I want to challenge you for the foundational motivations for rewards. And then, women, if you haven't heard this before, let me just put it on the screen for you. You earn rewards. You earn rewards. They're not given. We don't get to heaven. And Jesus says, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you're here. Here, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad you trust me. Listen, here are all my rewards. Distribute them equally. <clears throat> nope. It doesn't happen that way. You get what you earned in the area of rewards. That's why in Matthew 5, 11, 12, he says, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. Now, think about this. Jesus is saying, let's say you're out there in China. People find out you're a Christian, and they start kicking you and beating you for your faith. I would think the text would say, run. That's not what Jesus says. What does he say? Rejoice. Rejoice. For your what? In 
heaven is what? Hmm. If some's rewards in heaven, if some people's reward in heaven is great, that must mean some people's reward in heaven is not so great. Small. And that word reward is the Greek word mistos, which is also translated as the word wages. Why would it be wages there? Because you earn wages when you work X amount of dollars per hour. So too do you earn rewards when you serve our God. He gives you rewards, X amount of rewards for serving you. If you're beaten, those rewards are multiplied more. They're great rewards. Now, you have to notice something. Works are required for rewards. Works are required for rewards. Notice that also the, these are the requirements for ruling and reigning. We're going to look at the same passages. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with me on my father on his throne. To the one who conquers, he gets to sit with me on my throne. The word conquer is the Greek word nikeo from which we derive what word in the English language? It's on most of your shoes in this room. Nike. The man who made the Nike tennis shoe got his word from the Greek word nikeo, which means victorious. Finisher, the one who finishes strong. If you finish strong, you are a Nike Christian. You're a Nikeo. You're an overcomer. But notice the clarification. It's only the one who finishes strong that gets to what? Sit down with Christ on his throne. To the one who is victorious, Nikeo, and does my will to the end, I'll give authority over nations. Implying? Doesn't give. It's not given to everybody. If we what? Then we will reign. Oh, there's stipulations for power. Wow, I never saw that before. Most people assume the rewards are only given here on the earth, but Luke, he tells us, Jesus gave a parable. When you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. A lot of our rewards come after we die. That's why he says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now these rewards, another biblical way of saying it, is your inheritance. Your inheritance. Look at how Colossians puts it. Whatever you do, uh-oh, do. That must be works-oriented. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a what? Reward. Same word for reward. You earned it. What did you earn? You earned a what? Inheritance. An inheritance. Notice what Peter says about this inheritance. <coughs> Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For this great mercy he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, and into a what? That can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you. Now let me ask you a question. If the inheritance is in heaven, is it heaven itself? Yes or no? No. It's something you get in heaven. Oh, you mean... There's a difference between getting into heaven and getting an inheritance. Ah, oh, now you're beginning to understand. Yes, there's a huge difference. One is by grace, the other is by works. Rewards have nothing to do with getting into heaven. Okay? That is by faith alone. You get to heaven by faith alone. There is a big, big, big difference between having your name recorded in heaven and being rewarded in heaven. Having your name recorded in heaven is by faith alone. Being rewarded in heaven is solely by works. You do not get to heaven by faith plus works. Okay, turn to the person next to you. This is not a faith plus works message. I am not saying you've got to have faith in Jesus and do good works to get to heaven. No. 
You get to heaven solely by faith. But you get your inheritance based on works. works. Heaven is by faith. Your inheritance is by works. Now, most Christians have no idea that all believers are judged twice. How many of you knew all believers are judged twice? Let me see your hands if you knew that before. One day. About a quarter of you. All believers are judged twice. We're judged as a sinner. That's why in John 5, 24, it says, we pass from judgment into life, meaning we're not judged. But in 2 Corinthians 5, 10, it says, we're judged as a servant, and we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Mm, what do you mean? We're going to be judged, but we're not judged? Yes, that's correct. How's that? Because as a sinner, the question is whether or not we get into heaven. But as a servant, it's a question of whether or not we get our rewards, our inheritance. So we are judged twice. Let me try to graph this for you. If hell is in the black down here and heaven is up here, the blood of Jesus Christ takes us out of hell into heaven, but it does not earn us any rewards. The blood of Jesus earns us zero rewards. Our good works earn us rewards. This is the first judgment that was taken care of on the cross 2,000 years ago. This is the second judgment that comes after death that every Christian faces. It's called the judgment seat of Christ when he looks at our lives. Most Christians are basically unaware of the second judgment day. They, they have so focused on God's love. Cats have so focused on God's love, they ignore the fact that we will be held accountable. No, I'm not going to be held accountable. My sin is separated as far as the east is from the west. I'm not going to be held accountable. I pray the prayer in heaven. That's for getting into heaven. That has nothing to do with your works, your inheritance. You will be held accountable. That's why Paul says, for we, we believers, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is what? Oh, that sounds like you earned it. Guess what? You earned it based on your works. So I've got to be a good person to get to heaven, right? Is that what saying? No. You get to heaven by faith, faith but you earn your rewards, your inheritance. So that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad. What does God have in store for us? Well, he has in store for us a where he wants us to rule and reign. No wonder he said to the sheep, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit, ah, oh, there's the key word, inherit, the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, you gave me food, works. I was thirsty, you gave me drink, works. I was a stranger, you welcomed me, works. I was naked, you clothed me, works. I was sick, you visited me, works. I was in prison, you came to me, works, 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 works. I gotta be a good person to get to heaven, I just know it. It's there, it's all over. No, this is why we have complete denominations that say you have to be a good person to get to heaven. Why? They never saw a difference between inheriting the kingdom and entering the kingdom. This isn't about entering. This is about inheriting a kingdom based on works. Jesus repeatedly motivated us by rewards, power, possession, and pleasures. That's if, if you pray inside in private, you get rewards. If you fast without letting everybody know, you get rewards. If you take care of the poor, you get rewards. Matthew 6 is full of rewards. No wonder he says, the Son of Man is going to come with the glory of his Father and his angels and will then reward every man according to his what? Oh, I've got to be a good person to get that. But you've got to be a good person to get your full rewards. Absolutely. He's delivering the eternal return on our investment. And some EROIs will be big, some will be small. Rejoice, be glad for your reward in heaven is what? Great. Second Peter 1.10. If you do these things, you'll never stumble and you'll receive a what? Rich welcome, meaning some people are going to have a meager poor welcome. God 
loves me. He'd never do that. Oh, I'm sorry. It's all throughout the scripture. Some will have a rich welcome. Some will have a poor welcome. What's the purpose of his judgment name? He's going to see how he's going to reward us. He's going to see how our E-R-O-I did on the earth. Do you realize how important that makes these 80 years he allows us to live? 80 or so years. What we do in these 80 years will determine how we exist Will we get the kingdom intended for us? No wonder, Paul says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. What do you mean I gotta be faithful? I don't have to be faithful. I prayed the prayer. I'm in. I know I've got eternal security. I don't have to be faithful. I prayed the prayer. Well, that was for the first trip. But the second judgment says, it is required that you be found faithful. What's the word for faithful that I want to challenge you most Chinese put in there? Moreover, it is required that we Chinese Christians be found faithful. <laughs> No, I want to tell you, I don't think that's what it is. You guys aren't going to like me. What word do you think? If all your kids have to be doctors or lawyers or engineers, successful. Thanks for the Children, it's required that you be successful. Guess what? Success doesn't earn rewards. Faithfulness goes to rewards. That could fly in the very culture of the Chinese people. That's why nobody invites me back to speak this time. <laughs> it is required of stewards that they be found faithful, not successful. Faithful with the gifts and talents they bring. Some will have a rich welcome, some will have a poor welcome. As a result, we will not all be the same in heaven. There will be eternal differences in heaven. We find it in the parable of the talents. Some of us are going to rule over what? Ten cities. Some of us will rule over five cities. And some of us won't rule over any city. Some of us will rule over what? Some will rule over a little and some of us won't rule over anything. The Corinthians said, hey, Paul, with what kind of a body will we be raised to life in? What are our bodies going to be like, Paul, in heaven? He said, well, there is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars, for stars differ from star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. What is Paul suggesting? Some of us are going to shine like the... Some of us will shine like the... And some of us will shine like <coughs> we're not all going to be the same. Yet. There will also be different levels of authority in heaven. Do you all know that there are different levels of authority right now in the heavens right now, as we exist this very moment? Do we all know that or not? Okay. So in the book of Daniel, uh, the angel was sent to Daniel and saying, I've come to answer your prayer. And he said, I was thwarted. I was withheld. By the prince of Persia. In other words, that demon was a whole lot more powerful than me. I couldn't do anything to overtake him. For two weeks, I was held off, but I had to go get Michael. He was more powerful. There are different levels of authority right now in the heavens. It's going to be the same in eternity future. There will be different levels of authority. How do we know that? Take charge over ten cities. If you're over somebody, you've got to be under somebody. Some are over, some are under, some have both. What's the extent of ruling? Romans 8, it says we are co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we might also share in his glory. Co-heirs. An heir is someone who inherits something. You inherit from your parents' estate what's left over. If you're a co-heir, you get an equal share. Okay? 
So what does Christ inherit? Hebrews tells us, God, after he spoke long ago to his fathers and the prophets in many portions and many ways, in these last days he has spoken to us in his son, whom he appointed heir of what? What are all things? You can't say all things to define all things. This earth? What about Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter? Our solar system? The Milky Way galaxy? The universe? Yes or no? Yes. Christ inherits the universe, and what do we inherit, men and women? Oh, come on, you weren't, you didn't believe that. What do we inherit? Don't just say all things. What do we inherit? The universe. Christ inherits the universe, and we inherit the universe. What will we be doing over that universe? Sounds like science fiction. <laughs> but when you see, it's what four times about what God gets to do, not about what we get. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. He wants to put his grace on display. And that's putting his grace on display. Allowing us to rule and reign over the universe with the Son. God wants us ruling and reigning with his Son. Your life on this earth will determine at what level you rule and reign. So what should this priority be in working for treasures? Well, someone walked up to Jesus and said, Hey, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? What is the, what's the number one? Jesus did not say, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. No, he said, love the Lord your God. And love others. So if we're trying to prioritize what you're learning tonight, you'd say, you know what? If we were to rank these motivations, our number one should be two. Number two should be two. Number three should be two. Number four should be God's love. And number five should be four. I want to challenge you. I think God knew some people needed the extra motivation. And so he said, I put this in your human nature. foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and straw. Each man's work will become evident for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. So Paul is saying, basically, you can live your life as a cat, you can live your life as a dog. If you live like a, your life as a cat inside the church, your works will be like wood, hay, and straw. If you live like a dog, if you do things for my kingdom and not your kingdom, you'll have gold, silver, precious stones. Okay? Cats are successful for themselves. Dogs are faithful for his kingdom. And he says, the day will bring it to light, and the fire will test the quality of these men's work. What's the fire? What are we talking about here? Judgment day. That's right. The 2 Corinthians 5.10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So let's see what the two results are. If any man's work which he has built on it remains, he'll receive a what? The word is mythos, which means what? <coughs> you earned it. And what are you getting as your reward? Your inheritance, which is a kingdom to rule and to reign over with Christ. What's the opposite? If any man's work is burned up, live like a cat with hands strong. If it is burned up, he will what? Suffer loss, but he himself will be saved yet as through the fire. He will suffer loss. Do you want to know how that Greek word suffer loss can be accurately translated to help you make a whole lot more sense? Here it is. What will he be forfeit? Say it. Rewards. A kingdom. What? You wanted me to have that kingdom? It had my name all over from the beginning of time and now I don't get it? I'm sorry. You weren't 
faithful in a little. I'm not going to give you much. They're going to forfeit their kingdom. They'll shine like a star. They're not going to rule over anything, yet they'll be full of pleasure. Men and women, it is possible to get to heaven and lose Where I had you turn around to the person next to me and talk and say, This guy's telling me I might get to heaven and lose my mansion. It's scriptural. Will there be jealousy in heaven? No, our old natures are gone. Man, how's it going running into the kingdom I was supposed to have? I'm so proud of you. You must have lived such a faithful life. Wait, how's it going? Way to go. I'm so glad I can. Sweep your streets, whatever. So what is God's formula to live for eternal power, possessions, and pleasure? If God wants us to live for power, possessions, and pleasure, do you think he's given us a formula, yes or no? Yes? Would you like to know the formula, yes or no? Okay, the crowd's getting a little bit more alive. This is good. We learn it by looking at the life of Jesus. You ready? Here it goes. Deny now, gain greater. Deny now, gain later. Jesus denied power, possessions, and pleasure. Jesus said no to Satan three times in these three areas. And what happened? Therefore, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and have an earth and earth. Because he did not, he got it later. After making purification for sins, after suffering and dying, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Deny now. Gain later. How do you deny power now? Well, it's very simple. Quit trying to do things in your own power. Get down on your knees and pray. God, I can't do this. I know, I know my business, I could probably force this to make it work, but Lord, I'd be doing things in my own power, my own strength. God, I need you to act. I need you to move. I know I could be the president of the company. I know I could climb the ranks real fast, but God, if you want me over to, to reach one of these unreached, unengaged people, show me that. I'm willing to go. God, I'm willing to give it up. Show me what you are. I'm praying on all my knees. Deny it now. Deny power now. And he says, you will have it forever. Deny pleasure now. Quit enjoying everything around you and fast. I love what John Piper says. He says, fast whatever pleases you more than God. Does Facebook please you more than God? Can you spend two hours on Facebook without even blinking, but you have a hard time having a quiet time for 20, 20 minutes? Start fasting Facebook. Start fasting the internet. Start fasting shopping. Start fasting whatever pleases you more than God. Start fasting and say, God, I want you. Deny it now. Gain later. Possessions. How do you deny them now? Quit spending your money on yourself and give it away. Quit spending all the money on yourself and give it away. Give your money away. Give your life away. Deny now. Gain later. Oh, gee. Prayer, giving, and fasting. Ah, the three basic tenets of the Christian life. They correlate directly with power possessions, and pleasure. If you have a drive in you to be the best, that's there by God. He says, I want you to be the best for all eternity. I want you ruling and reigning by my side. Deny the power now and gain it later forever. 
So, let's take a second look at this passage. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If one not so, I would have told you, for I go and prepare a place for you. Remember, my whole supposition is, most Christians have said, I already got a mansion, thank you very much. I don't need a bigger bedroom. I don't need a larger kitchen. I'm happy with what I got. I'm not going to do radical obedience. I'm not going to go to the nations. Right? Go to these unrich people groups in China that have never heard Jesus. No way. That would make me feel good that God loves me. And he wouldn't want me to not feel good. So, nope, not going to happen. Let's look at this passage. He used three separate words. In my father's house. The Greek word is oikia. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. But it means a house or an inhabitant of this, a dwelling. So in my father's dwelling. Where does, where does God dwell? The whole universe. So what Jesus could be saying is this. Throughout the universe where my father dwells. Okay, accurate translation so far, right? Yes, no. Okay. Throughout the universe where my father dwells are many places. I don't know how you pronounce that. A uh, staying, an abiding, a dwelling, an abode, to make one's abode, a mansion. Uh, uh, that's where they get the mansion idea from. A metaphor for the Holy Spirit of the I would say a, a staying or a, a dwelling. Okay? So what Christ could be saying is this. Throughout the universe where my Father dwells, I'm preparing a residence for you. Hmm. Okay. The third word is topos. Oh, it's a holy word. Interesting. What's that word mean? Well, from the Greek, it could mean a place or position or space marked off. It's a word from shrouded space. And have a place as a city, a village, a district, a place, passage, as in a book. The condition or station held by one in any company or assembly, opportunity or power. A station held in a company. Power. You know what Christ could actually be saying? Throughout the universe where my father dwells, I'm preparing a residence for you in a city or village where you will govern, rule, and reign with me. But from 1 Corinthians, we realize not everybody's going to get that dwelling. Because if they live like a cat with one hand straw, it all turns up. They forfeit their kingdom. They forfeit their residence. They forfeit ruling and reigning. They'll be in heaven. question is not, will my master bedroom be two feet bigger, will my kitchen be larger, will my mansion have more guest bedrooms? Here's the question. Will I rule and reign with Christ on this throne as God wants me to? Will I earn the kingdom God prepared for me before the creation of the world? Or will I get to heaven Lose my kingdom. I want to challenge you. The return on your investment far outweighs the cost. There is no cost in light of what you get. That's why Paul said it's not worth comparing. Not worth comparing. But here's the problem with most American Christians. We are so comfortable here in America. We have everything we need. We're not motivated. And we so focused on God's love. We say there's no accountability. He loves me. My sin is as far as the east is from the west. I'm to be held accountable. No, sorry. I'm going to heaven. That's all I care about. How's your EROI doing? How's your eternal 401k doing? Pray. Give. Fast, verb, okay. All of this is found in these two books, the book Why and the book If I'm Saved by Grace. Uh, if I'm Saved by Grace is in PDF form. If you want a hard copy, you've got to go to our website to get it. If you want a PDF, Jerry, I'll mail, mail you one. Email Jerry. Uh, if you want uh, to email me questions, Anything along, if you would like to get on our email newsletter list, okay, here is my email address, onejealousgod at gmail.com. 
onejealousgod at gmail.com. If you want our email newsletter list, Debbie and I send out an email every time you travel and speak asking for prayer. Email me, and I will put you on that, and uh, I'll, I would appreciate your prayers. But it's time for your small groups. Why did you learn? What's God speaking to you? Go to your small groups. You've got two minutes.
So that is what I learned. It's like you just focus on doing, focus on training, focus on getting to the others, focus on fasting on your, on your own, own things, focus on things itself. Then the rewards got in your head. We don't, we don't need to plan that. We don't need to plan that. So I think that's very unusual. Good activity was like, and I think I made mean, benefit from that. Good, good. Anybody else? Okay, go back to your small groups. If the church knew this teaching, do you think it would change the entire DNA of the church? Yes or no? Go to your small groups. Because this church is, this teaching is not known. If it were known, it would it change the DNA of the church?
Okay, I don't know Chinese culture that much, so I'm just going to randomly call on people. Oh, young lady, you. Stand up, tell them. Can I, can I get a wireless here or not? Yes, sir.
May I would like to uh, teach this uh, wonderful truth to uh, the whole church, to focus on the priority, focus on the eternal uh, investment. Also, Jerry, you wrap it up or what? Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Thank you so much, Bob, for all the information. Okay. Good. Thank you.